Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending our second session and update on the Ukrainian situation uh, in Europe and its possible implications for investments. So we've this is our second session, and in the first one, we reviewed the uh, situation kind of on the ground and what the possible investment implications might be. Um, up to up to this point, we have a situation where Russia actually invaded uh, the Ukraine. In the beginning, uh, we and a lot of other people expected the Ukraine to be fairly rapidly overrun and a puppet government installed with a kind of forced negotiated settlement. Uh, none of that has happened. Uh, Russia did invade, uh, but was not overrun. Um, the reasons were uh, underestimating the resolve of the Ukrainian people and the, how they were united in opposition to the invasion. Uh, there was unlooked for leadership in the Ukraine that seemingly came out of nowhere. It looks like um, on the surface, there's been a high degree of um, incompetence, really, on the part of the Russian military uh, with respect to the in, in, inv invasion, the ta strategy, and even the ta tactics of execution. Certainly, there's been logistical incompetence where we have anecdotes of entire units running out of uh, fuel and, and even food. Uh, there's been unexpected Western resolve in opposition uh, and unexpectedly united and harsh sanctions across multiple dimensions uh, worldwide. And so um, these are all big surprises. And uh, to the credit of the Biden administration, they've um, orchestrated a united uh, Western uh, response to the invasion and uh, even worldwide response in, in some aspects. And so that's where we stand today. When you look at the maps in the media, and again, my caveat from the first session, by the way, is just be careful of what you uh, consume in terms of news on this subject, because a lot of the news we get is decidedly uh, pro-Ukrainian. Um, and uh, uh, we don't really know what is actually going on in the ground there. And I'm not saying that because I don't support the Ukrainians. I'm just saying that's the tilt on the news and we really don't know what is really happening. Um, but from all the different angles of reporting and the people talking about what's going on on the ground and in, in the outside of the Ukraine, we can kind of draw some broad conclusions, but I'd be careful in what I, uh, what I would uh, represent in detailed fashion. But you know, right now the Russians, the, the, you look at maps on the news and they show all these areas controlled by the Russian invaders. But in reality, I think they only really control the roads, not necessarily big swaths of Ukrainian territory. And certainly they haven't taken any of the major cities yet. Um, the Ro Russians are currently ro rotating out conscripts in their military units and uh, replacing them with more battle-hardened soldiers from Russia and elsewhere. And the Russians are attempting to resupply uh, their forward units with mixed success. And so they seem to be shifting to the playbook they did in Finland in the 40s, 1940s, and Grozny uh, about 14 years ago, uh, where they went into more or less siege warfare and leveled cities and then took them uh, and uh, forced negotiated settlements. That seems to be where we're going at this point in time. So we believe the most likely outcome is still a negotiated settlement, but probably more in favor of uh, the Ukraine than we thought a few weeks ago. We, you know, it's not necessarily the, necessary that a puppet government is installed uh, or that the Ukraine give up all the territory originally thought. Um, and uh, in terms of an uh, econ economic outcome, the the, U the Ukraine would like to be a member of NATO. We doubt that'll happen. They would like to be uh, admitted to the EU, the European Union. Um, and uh, the Russians uh, yesterday or today came out and said that would be um, almost a hostile act. And so where all that falls is is uncertain at this point. But what we do know, what I do know, 
is that the Russian armed forces, even before their disastrous performance so far in the invasion, there were not enough of them, um, nor the logistical support to actually conquer and occupy the Ukraine. Uh, that was never uh, a possibility, much less move through the Ukraine or across Bel Belarus and invade NATO countries. I think that speculation is um, borders on uh, humorous to me that um, the, uh, the, the Russians would go through the Ukraine then invade any NATO countries um, at this point in time. Uh, for the Ukrainians, the outcome is still highly uncertain. I think it's very premature to declare the Ukraine's the winner. Uh, the Russians are going to grind down some cities. If they, when they fall, they'll move those resources to another city, and uh, and and that will be the progression. So how it all plays out is still very very uncertain. Um, I think it's important to know that NATO, uh, absent some uh, contingencies that we're not thinking of today, but as things stand right now, NATO will not join the conflict because that would put them in a position of directly uh, being involved with Russian soldiers. So it would lead to the, A, the risk of nuclear war, but B, another really important point, um, I, I think, is that if NATO uh, or any country in NATO join the conflict directly uh, and, and uh, put themselves in a position to fight against Russian soldiers or aircraft, that in Russia would legitimize the U.S. and or NATO as opponents rather than the Ukraine and might serve to mobilize Putin's popularity or the popularity of war of the war in Russia uh, rather than having their Ukrainian brethren um, as the opponent, which does not seem to sit nearly as well. I think that's actually a more important reason for NATO not to join the conflict. So having said that, I'd like to move on a little bit to some of the possible uh, economic outcomes here. The, in the first session, we talked about how the, in total, the Ukraine and Russia were right around 2% of the world economy, almost de minimis. So the, the uh, influence of uh, whatever happens in those two countries with respect to world trade or world economics is really small. But however, there are some important point areas uh, where Russia and the Ukraine combined have an outsized impact on uh, world economics, and those are largely in the area of commodity flows. Um, uh, the Ukraine uh, uh, and Russia together uh, export a, a large portion of agricultural products, wheat, barley, mostly wheat, but also barley and corn. Um, a sizable amount, uh, up to world th one third of the world's barley, a fifth of the corn, and uh, one third of the wheat production between those two. And uh, the, the growing and the transport of that to countries who don't have the growing capacity um, is a problem. So we have a, a situation where if this uh, conflict rages on, uh, wheat prices and uh, food prices in general could go up a lot for a lot of countries. And if the war is goes on for a long time, uh, there, there may be uh, hunger and starvation, actually. And God forbid uh, another major producer uh, has a bad crop while this is going on. So there, um, if you remember... Uh, uh, back in around the time of the global financial crisis, there was the Arab uprising um, where uh, a lot of it was driven by food and energy costs soaring in, in some of the developing world and were set up uh, for a situation like that again in the countries that can't grow uh, food. In terms of energy, we have a situation um, where both sides need each other. The Europeans cannot, especially the Germans, cannot readily replace uh, uh, energy, uh, ga gas and oil exports from the, Sov uh, the Russians. Um, and the Russians cannot just cut the Europeans off and shift production to the Asians because the Europeans are supplied from oil fields in the west of, of Russia. And there are no access points from those fields across Russia to the east, no pipelines, 
you know, infra other types of infrastructure where they could um, produce the oil in the western fields in the Caucasus Mountains um, and have it moved over to China, Japan, or whatever countries in Asia would take it. Um, and even if they could do it by sea, uh, the passage through the Black Sea is suspect. Um, even if you could get ships to tankers to load, uh, you probably couldn't get them insured. Um, and so just turn, flipping the switch and saying, well, uh, the Europeans won't be able uh, to consume this oil. Either they'll shut it off or the Russians will, um, but we'll just jigger the production and consumption around the world. Someone else will take the European share and the Europeans will get more out of Saudi Arabia. That won't work because of the um, logistics around the Russian fields. So um, if the supply of oil from either side is curtailed, that will res result in sustained high oil prices and even, you know, trying to figure out where that extra oil is going to come from. And uh, from the Russian perspective, they desperately need the income. Their, their foreign exchange income is almost exclusively from the sale of agricultural products, metals, uh, or energy. And from their point of view, if they, um, they don't have much oil storage, if they if they don't have customers, they don't have any storage, they have to start shutting down wells and facilities. And that takes a long time once they're shut down to bring them back online. So the, when the Soviet Union collapsed, um, there was a lot of oil production that was shut down. And only in the last year or two has Russian oil production matched what it did, what it was 30 years ago. So it, that would be a disastrous outcome. And uh, with Western oil uh, expertise and technology leaving the Soviet Union, they can't run their fields, especially the Eastern fields, um, uh, which is what they use to export to Asia right now. Um, their production will eventually decline um, uh, probably precipitously without Western, Western uh, energy expertise. The Chinese do not have uh, oil field expertise. So, uh, they can't go there to get that. So tightness in the energy market, traditional energy markets could continue, um, possible crisis in the wheat markets. Uh, fertilizers is another area used for uh, uh, nit nitrogen. Russia is a huge producer of nitrogen, something like 16% of the world output of fertilizers that go to um, countries that grow wheat or other agricultural products, that could cause shortages as well if this conflict goes on for a long time. And that could manifest itself again through high uh, commodity prices. Um, and then we also have uh, sanctions on the level of individuals, institutions, central banks, and Western businesses pulling out of Russia, not to mention the oil companies, but you know, even firms like McDonald's or um, uh, data firms that provide day-to-day -day goods, services, food are are walking away from stores, assets in Russia, and, and not doing business, and they will not be easily replaced. But again, that that may influence the earnings of some of these individual companies, but it shouldn't have a big impact on the world. Uh, so, what do we see from the in, uh, investment world? Well, the uh, increased commodity prices will be good for companies that. Um, own or extract or distribute commodities. Um, we uh, have been favorable to that disposition uh, from an investing perspective from, for some time because the prices, uh, we've always been worried about unexpected inflation increasing, which it has and was well on its way to increasing before the Russian invasion. Uh, and has continued, uh, the price of energy has continued to go up, as has have many other uh, um, commodities. So the old economy uh, stuff, energy, metals, agriculture, fertilizers, um, are all things um, that the war will put pressure on in terms of pricing. Um, the other big impact investment-wise, which may play out over a longer period of time, is the impact on globalization. So. Uh, the other day, President Biden talked about a new world order, um, trying to pull um, uh, sense or cohesion out of what's happened here after the war. 
uh, that America would lead, you know, the, the, the blocks of uh, going forward. And, and the um, Russian invasion of the Ukraine has somewhat, uh, in our opinion, soured uh, a little bit the Russian, Russian Chinese axis or relationship uh, that seemed to be starting uh, shortly before the war. Um, and, and is also shown from a military and economic perspective the weakness of that block relative uh, to that of a United uh, United States and Europe. Um, the we're also starting to see the concept of money called into question. Uh, one of the most important sanctions, unexpected sanctions uh, from the West, was on the Russian central bank, where they had before the war. Uh, we talked about this last in the last uh, meeting, um, prepared themselves with uh, over $600 billion of, of gold and foreign currency reserves. And the sanctions on the central bank have rendered the Russians unable to really transact in the foreign currencies reserves they hold. They can still transact with the gold. Um, and, and seeing that, other countries who are have uh, built up uh, foreign currency reserves uh, for um, a rainy day, uh, might be viewing gold for that purpose a little more under a little more favorable light. That could be bullish for gold going forward as a, a currency reserve. Um, but also, people are looking at what's going on with the dollar and saying this is being used as a weapon against us, which really started back in the uh, you know as, as long as we said we're doing sanctions. Uh, certainly back to 2014 during the Obama administration where there were uh, sanctions uh, when the uh, Russians annexed uh, the, the Crimea. And then uh, President Trump uh, made uh, sanctions and weaponization of the uh, U.S. Uh, financial, the system, you know, the financial world financial system dominated by the U.S. as part of a negotiating tool in trade negotiations. And now it's it's gone full force uh, all the uh, trade, monetary sanctions, individual sanctions, all brought to a head against Russia. And so people are might be looking at alternatives to the U.S. financial system and the dollar in the future. Now, no other national currency is even remotely close to meeting the requirements for a, a world reserve currency at this point in time. Uh, China's brought up a lot in that context, but they, they still have a controlled currency um, not deep and liquid uh, derivatives markets to support them. Um, they're way far off from being able to do that. But that's a, a long-term trend that might be accelerated um, uh, here. And the other aspect is, uh, you know, businesses um, sallying forth and helping in the uh, in the sanctions, more or less, by ceasing to do business in Russia. How many? How fast? And across the world was a was a big surprise. Um, so, from a portfolio standpoint, uh, the U.S. market has already recovered from the day of the invasion and is actually up almost seven percent since the day of the invasion. The European stock market, uh, from the day of the invasion, went down as far as fourteen percent and change. It's now down only 1.4%, uh, ditto Japan, one in uh, about 1.7%. Uh, and the emerging markets are down about 6% from the, uh, and, and of course, Russia is an emerging market, so is China categorized as an emerging market. And so even though this is a, an Im impact of tremendous um, concern with respect to humanitarian, moral, and economic dimensions, uh, from the pers perspectives of markets, the markets have done what they usually do during big geopolitical events as they go down a little or a lot, and then they recover within a short, relatively short period of time, which they, they've done. So um, the uh, urge to make portfolio changes or investment changes based on a geopolitical event can be almost irresistible, but over uh, even even during World War II, I think I mentioned in the first session, uh, stock market returns were positive over the course of World War II, um, at a f just under 5% per year on average. So um, playing markets with geo uh, geopolitical events is 
is usually um, going against the historical record. And uh, we definitely don't want to respond to emotion uh, when making portfolio decisions. And as I mentioned, the markets have recovered nicely. But in the future, what are we likely to see? Well, in addition to the monetary issues I talked about, uh, we also have an, an environment of increasing interest rates and, and inflation that has risen. Whether or not it stays where it is or increases further, we don't know. But there's arguments on both sides of that that are legitimate. Um, uh, outside the U.S., uh, in the EM countries, rates are already high. I would say that in Europe uh, and emerging markets, the prices that you're paying for a dollar of corporate earnings there are really already priced uh, for an event like this or even uh, beginning of a recession, uh, whereas I can't say that about the U.S. So um, uh, be, make sure we, you have diversification around the world outside the U.S. Take advantage of some of the decline, de depressed pricing there. Um, if you're worried about inflation, the Russian invasion will magnify that. And so if your portfolio has some extra inflation sensitive assets um, for further development, possible developments in that area, that, that would seem to be prudent. Um, and so if anything else uh, happens here of uh, material import, um, we'll be back with a third session. And I thank you all for spending some time with us uh, again today and look forward to meeting with you all again soon.